Well, as it turns out, Luigi was really in the game. Maybe aliens built the Mario Universe pyramids? This beta build was notably not the same as the alleged uh, July 29, 1995 build of the game, which actually features lower on this iceberg, one level away from the bottommost darkest section. Speaking of parallel universes... Ah oh yes, the Mario 64 iceberg. Chances are, you've already heard of this thing. That's probably why you clicked on this video, because you want to know more about what dark, unknown secrets lurk within one of the most influential childhood games of all time. Turns out, there actually are some pretty interesting secrets hiding in the game, and it took decades of research and devotion to uncover them. Some of the secrets are simple, but some are far more consequential, or sinister, than we ever imagined when we first picked up that N64 controller. Some even say every copy of Super Mario 64 is personalized, usually by a way ahead of its time AI, that uses anything and everything available in the game assets to fit the gameplay to you, the player, specifically. This iceberg is largely inspired by those original ideas, which spawned countless creepypastas and spooky urban legends. Of course, despite what a few diehard fans may say, this 1996 game is certainly not personalized. The game's source code has been leaked and data miners have found little to no evidence of this phenomenon. It is, however, a very fun idea, and it is this idea which is more important. It has led to variations and full-on remakes of the original game, sometimes just to satisfy the urge to see a creepy tale about the game brought to life. Since this iceberg covers a lot of stuff, and I'd like to give plenty of time to some of the more interesting concepts closer to the bottom, I'll be splitting this into a short series of five videos, with this first video covering the first two layers on the surface. We'll give each of the remaining lower three tiers their own video, respectively, and in a final video, I'll really dig into the line at the very bottom of the iceberg. Every copy of Mario 64 is personalized. Strap in as we board Bowser Sub for a trip down the Super Mario 64 iceberg. Ale is Real 2401 is one of Mario's most infamous mysteries, coming from the plaque on the star statue in the garden behind the castle. On this plaque is some very blurry text, courtesy of the graphical limitations of game development at the time, that many presume to read Ale is Real, followed by the number 2401, and some dedicated Nintendo fans spent years deciphering its cryptic meaning, always coming to the conclusion that Luigi had to be in the game somewhere, despite never making an appearance. Heck, even Yoshi makes an appearance atop the castle after collecting all 120 stars. So where was the Mario franchise's second most popular character? Well, as it turns out, Luigi was really in the game, just not accessible. On July 25th, 2020, which was 24 years and one month after Mario 64's initial release in Japan, a leak containing the source code assets for the game revealed that a model for Luigi did indeed exist, but was never actually implemented in the final cut. Makes you wonder. Space World 95 Beta is another name for the Shinkai Beta, a build of Super Mario 64 that was debuted at Space World, then called Shinkai, in late November of 1995. This beta build was notably not the same as the alleged uh, July 29, 1995 build of the game, which actually features lower on this iceberg, one level away from the bottommost darkest section. A number of mechanics and designs for the beta versions were totally different, such as Mario spinning after performing a triple jump, and Peach's castle looking like it comes straight from an alternate universe, uncanny in that some levels are in the same place, but nearly none of the design is the same. Speaking of parallel universes, Parallel universes refers to an interesting phenomenon wherein the player's coordinate position exceeds the 16-bit integer limit using calculations for Mario's movement, and this causes an overflow to occur and returns an unexpected result from the code. Basically, if Mario gets going fast enough to shoot out of bounds and pass a certain faraway point, and we mean really fast and really far, then the map will essentially loop back around. This is called a PU, or Parallel Universe, because while it does appear normal at first glance, it is missing much of the life that makes up the main universe version of the level, consisting mostly of terrain and such. Oh yeah, and all the textures are missing. Apparently, players have reported game crashes and even console malfunctions due to the overflow nature of the values used in the glitch, so it can be considered slightly dangerous to perform. Uh, Pan and Koek 2012, one of Mario's greatest and most determined players, has famously made use of these PUs, and they even get used in the tool-assisted speedruns for the fastest possible time to beat Mario 64. Uh, since we mentioned Pan and Koek 2012, let's mention something that they have had to explain quite a few times now. The half A press is essentially a trick used to perform maneuvers in a stage which require the A button to be currently in the held position, but does not require the player to have it pressed down within the stage. Therefore, a player can press down on the A button to perform a required jump uh, somewhere in the castle to enter a stage, but continue into and throughout the stage without letting up on that A press. Since one A press does the job of two in this case, it's called a half A press. That's pretty much all it is, just an interesting little idea. The impossible coin slash Goomba refers to a coin on Tiny Big Island and a Goomba on Bowser in the Sky, which both exist outside of the regular bounds of play for Mario and thus could not theoretically be collected or defeated in normal gameplay. 
Clever players have since proven that both the coin and the Goomba can be interacted with through very precise manipulation of gameplay mechanics, and the reasoning for why they are out of bounds in the first place has been easily chalked up to bugs from development, making this particular part of the iceberg less mysterious than it was years ago. The Womp's Fortress Tower 1-Up is a well-hidden 1-Up that you can get by breaking away the bottom of one of the tower's side walls with a punch on Womp's Fortress. It's probably here because most people have no idea it's even on the level, including me. I had to load up my game real quick just to make sure this 1-Up really was there and not just some urban legend. Uh, it really, really is there. The Bob Omb Battlefield Bridge Hang is just something you can do under the bridge in the first stage. If you stand under the lower part of the bridge and jump, holding the A button, you can hang onto a phantom ledge that results from the bridge's texture not exactly matching its collision box. A minor detail, but sort of interesting. Okay, we've gotten through the easiest part of the iceberg, where only a little bit of info is visible, and we're still above the surface. Let's dive below the water, though, and explore a level deeper. A little darker. Big Boo's unused text is a piece of leftover text that was unused in the original game, which specifically and solely mentions Luigi. The line simply reads, Luigi, Luigi. It was probably intended to be something Big Boo says to Luigi, but of course, Luigi didn't make it into the final cut of the game, and neither did this text. Ghoul Metal is another piece of text from Big Boo's haunt that players have ruminated upon, perhaps far too long. If the player survives the mansion, the sign says they should get a Ghoul Metal instead of a Gold Metal, and likely just a play on words, but that doesn't stop players from claiming they've seen this Ghoul Metal in-game, however. Don't Become His Lunch is a line that can be read on a sign in Hazy Maze Cave near the pool of water Dory is swimming in, referencing the sea dragon directly. Only thing is, Dory is female, and completely harmless. Shh, please walk quietly in the hallway, can be found on a sign in the upper part of the castle, on the side of the stairs. It could be interpreted as menacing, but it's more likely that it's just some throwaway text that developers hardly thought much about. Dancing flowers are an unused object that probably would have acted similarly to the snow and lava bubble effects in their respective stages, with small dancing flowers cropping up as Mario passes by. Sadly, we never got to see these flowers in action, but you can observe a butterfly sometimes if you're quick. Volcano blocks are the ruinous columns near the hot foot into the volcano star in Lethal Lava Land. They're not particularly interesting, other than that they have a texture not seen elsewhere on the stage, which is purported to look metallic. Though if you ask me, I would just as easily agree that it's just some stone ruins. Blarg is an unused reddish dinosaur enemy in Mario 64, inspired by their counterpart that appeared in Super Mario World. They would appear uh, in lava, uh, popping out to attack Mario, but they never made it into the final cut of the game. The Blarg model even remains rough and unfinished. Bugged fire texture refers to the fact that the smoky texture that appears behind Mario when he gets burned and starts running is fairly low quality, and this is because the texture is rendered with the wrong texture format in the code. Fixing this one line gives a much smoother texture that originally never saw the light of day. Big Dud is what the Pink bomb -oms call King bomb -om after his defeat. Sure enough, a third rolling ball is in the pit at the bottom of the mountain. A pretty rough fate for the king. Womp King turns into the castle is pretty vague, but I presume it means that the Womp King at the top of the stage is essentially pounded into the ground as the literal foundation stone of the tower that appears afterwards. Uh, pretty grim end for the kings in this game, but it does make a bit of sense. E.T. in Pyramid refers to a set of hieroglyphs inside the pyramid on Shifting Sandland, where the letters E and T next to each other can be clearly seen. Or is it so clear? It's possible that it's something else, and coincidentally only appears to be the letters E.T., but it's hard to say. Maybe aliens built the Mario Universe pyramids? JRB Vanishing Fog refers to the environmental fog that lays low on the level when first entering Jolly Roger Bay. After getting the star for plunder in the sunken ship, though, the fog is lifted and the stage is a bit brighter. The change goes fairly unnoticed by most players, myself included, but it does seem to fuel the fires of Mario 64 being personalized, as the level looks different at different points of play. Unagi Tunnel is an alleged area of Jolly Roger Bay that can be accessed by going into the tunnel the eel, or the Unagi, comes out of initially with the star on its tail. It's supposed to be a creepy underwater level that exists in personalized copies of the game, but let's be honest, it probably just cropped up from how it seems like you should be able to enter the tunnel that the Unagi exits, but you just can't. Secret Aquarium is just the name of a level that hosts one of the castle's secret stars accessible through a hole near the ceiling in the room with the Jolly Roger Bay painting. The stage is just a big windowed box full of water and fish, so it's definitely got an odd vibe to it, but it's not particularly secret. Mips throwing refers to the fact that Mara used to be able to grab Mips by the ears and throw it normally. This development detail comes from Miyamoto directly, so it's a strong source, and you can apparently still see Mario toss Mips in the finished game by taking the rabbit underwater. That's kinda wild. The yellow cap switch is an unused asset that didn't make it into the final cut of the game, much like Blarg or the Dancing Flowers. It also comes with its own transparent floating box, and it seems like it was intended to activate the yellow boxes that held items like Koopa shells within. In the end, the yellow cap switch was cut, and the yellow boxes were made available to Mario from the start. Broken Paintings refers to the idea that personalized versions of Mario 64 contain torn paintings, which uh, are damaged versions of regular paintings. Speculation on such paintings rarely agree on how they operate, in that some are said to lead to glitchy versions of their respective stages, and some simply reveal a hidden space behind the painting with a reward. Some theorize the phenomenon occurs naturally, some say it can be caused by punching or kicking the painting enough. Who knows? 
The mirror room is, of course, the room with the giant mirror wall that can be found behind a door on the upper level of the castle. It hosts no man's land, which is entered much like Shifting Sandland is entered by jumping through a wall. There are a couple of oddly shaped pillars, are they podiums, here that seem to do nothing, and the mirror is just used to hint to the player that no man's land even exists, since the mirrored version of the room does have a painting on the wall. However, mirrors have always fascinated and spooked people through the ages, and this mirror seems to have much the same effect on players. When I was younger, I used to think there was something hidden in the mirror too. I tried and tried to figure out if it held a secret we just didn't know about yet. The Diaz version of the game put to rest any mysteries, however, as Luigi can simply enter the mirror side of the room, uh, go through the mirror door, and get a simple castle star inside the blank room. That's all. Yoshi's saddle just refers to the fact that the saddle in the finished game has a red trim instead of its usual white, which is apparently a minor oversight on the texturing. And finally, the only things in this section that I can't really explain are HMC Alcove and JRB Box. JRB Box is probably a reference to the crate on the ship in Jolly Roger Bay, but I'm not sure why it's on the iceberg really. Don't get me wrong, the fact that the crate was so dangerous despite being literally just a box was always off-putting. I really didn't like that box, but it's not really too mysterious. I guess we can wonder what's in it. As for HMC Alcove, I presume this is the cave behind the waterfall with the green cap switch for the metal cap, but as strange as that small area is, it's never struck me as all that weird. Maybe they're referring to the rumor I've heard that is a drainage pipe leading into the, one of the water worlds, but your guess is as good as mine. Well, that covers the first two layers of the Super Mario 64 iceberg, and already it has been full of strange and mysterious findings. Before we go, however, let's take a sneak peek at something interesting from the next layer below. Mario 64 is Freemason Initiation. Now, that line seems like a bit of a stretch. Even if Freemasons did have anything to do with the development of Mario 64, it was certainly not likely that it was with the intent to initiate members into their group. However, the conspiracy still lingers, spurred on by connections between Freemason imagery and imagery within the game. For instance, the checkerboard floor with the large sun depicted in the middle is a common piece of Freemason imagery, and the first floor of Peach's Castle has its design. Chances are, however, this was just thought of as a nice design, and the Freemasons were known for designing some nice buildings after all. The coins in the game are simply circles with five-pointed star inside and, oh, oops, accidentally implemented pentacles into Mario. Pentacles are somewhat associated with Freemasons, but not so much more than some other groups, so I don't really see the connection. But wait, there's more. If you want to dive deeper into the Super Mario 64 iceberg and hear more about Mario's Freemason connections, and so, so much more, then check out part two linked here now on the end screen. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a quick like and subscribe if you want to see more. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.